Hey there everyone! Today on the show we're going to be looking at rhythm games. Rhythm is the one of the most important things to teach your students. Rhythm skills, improving their rhythm skills, because this is one of the things that if they don't have good rhythm skills now, it's going to come back to bite you seriously down the track. That is something I have absolutely seen again and again in my own teaching. Oh my gosh, there we go. So, we're going to be looking at some rhythm games today and helping you to improve your students' rhythm, whether you're teaching in online lessons or in person. So let's go ahead and get started. Right, we are ready to rock and roll. I see some of you have joined in already and are saying hello. Hi to Christy. Nicola, I don't think I've seen you on one of these live chats before. Welcome if you're new. Charlotte, Eloise back again. Carrie, awesome. Kelly, Megan, great to see you here. Claire, Lori, uh, Lee from Alabama. Awesome. Oh, that's really fun, Lee. So you are catching up on a replay earlier and now we're live again. Not how that happens. Hi to Cindy and Faye and Julie and Constance. Don't think I've seen you here either, Constance, unless you were stum last time. And Teresa and Jody. Oh my gosh, so great to have so many people here to learn about teaching our students great, amazing rhythm skills. If you are joining us, please do say hi. It means a lot to me to hear you chime in in the chat, to hear your questions as we go through, and to build up that community, because that's what all these chats are about. They're about us coming together. They're not about me sharing ideas. I do share ideas, but they're really about bringing us together as a community and as an industry and strengthening ourselves together. That sounds very grandiose, doesn't it? But anyway, bringing us together so that we can connect and share ideas and make our whole industry stronger, right? What a great way to start off your Wednesday if it's morning time for you. So we are talking today about rhythm, but before I get to that, I have a few bits of housekeeping as usual to update you guys about. So first of all, um, if you missed it, we have a webinar coming up on Friday. So we have a vibrant music teacher chat like this in the afternoon, so that's early for you, those of you over in the US and Canada. And then later on, a few hours later, is the webinar. So you can sign up for that at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash funnels. It's going to be about taking a very human, very um, kind, I guess, uh, and not yucky approach to marketing. <laughs> Okay, marketing without being icky while still remember um, remaining a human to human business and feeling like you're connecting with your customers rather than pushing stuff at them, right? So that is what that's going to be about. That's on Friday. Make sure to sign up. If any of you watching live happen to be on the hunt for a side job, a side gig to go alongside your teaching, you might like to check out the job postings that we currently have available. I've already received some amazing applications and I love for these jobs to be filled by people from the community. Um, a lot of the people on my team are actually teachers and a lot of them were VMT members before they joined up and became one of the team and that's fantastic because it means that they get you guys, they get us, right? And they work so much better. And it's also a great way to combine something with your teaching, right? It's a great opportunity for that. I know many teachers struggle to fill daytime hours so that they can, you know, free up some of the evening hours and not have to teach so much uh, so that they can spend time with family, all of that stuff. So it's just this, there are two small part-time positions, only a few hours a week and you might be interested in those, feel free to check them out. Last couple of bits of housekeeping. Number one is that we have uh, still have our deal on for those who need access to resources to help you with online teaching and teaching in general inside Vibrant Music Teaching. So I saw many members live. If you're not a member yet and you want to try it out, you want to test the waters, you can do so with the coupon code online and that will get you a one week trial for just $1. Okay, if you decide to cancel before the end of the week, that's absolutely fine. You won't be charged again. 
if you decide to stick around with us, it's $25 a month as usual. And that deal is going away next week. End of next week. So you're going to want to jump to it because otherwise you'll forget and then it'll be too late and then you'll be kicking yourself that you didn't try it out while it was there. So make sure to grab that if you're interested in checking out the membership. And let's get into some rhythm, shall we? What do you struggle with most when it comes to rhythm? I know when I ask this, normally one of the top answers is dotted rhythms. Is that going to be the case for you? Are you guys struggling to teach dotted rhythms? I know a lot of people struggle with this, and this really transformed for me when I started using Kadai language. So we before I have four games to share with you guys today, but before I even get into those, let me talk to you a bit first about Kadai syllables, because that really has changed my whole game. Pun intended. Um, so I use Kadai syllables in my studio for all my beginner students and even occasionally with more advanced students as they're useful. So Kadai syllables are uh, like ta and titi. You're probably familiar with them even if you don't know them by that name. You can also use takadimi or gordon, although that's a little bit different. The reason I Kadai syllables are so useful is that because they're easy to say. That's the main reason, because you can vocalize the rhythm. It's much easier to say ta, ti, 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 ta, than one, two, and three, and four, especially if you are a little kid, right? And especially, especially if there's a language barrier. That's come up for me a lot lately with a few students who English is still not their strongest language. And our numbers are quite difficult to get your mouth around <laughs> when you're not super comfortable with English. So, I mean, I let them count in their own language, of course, but, or in their first language, but um, ta and titi, it's universal. It works for everyone and it's a great system to use. So I would be using that for all of these games that I'm about to share with you interchangeably. Um, sorry, I just answered that question. Bagyard, bagyard, not sure of your real name there. It's Vibrant Music Teaching. Where is my coupon? There. VibrantMusicTeaching.com That is our membership site. You're welcome to sign up for the one week trial there. So, yeah. I highly encourage you to give Kadai syllables or some other syllabic sy sy syllabic? Syllabic <laughs> system for rhythm a uh, go um, if you haven't already. If you're counting straight away with all your beginners, it really isn't the most effective in the beginning stages. And even as you go through, it's great for them to have something to another tool in their tool belt. Lots of likes coming through for that. So I think a lot of you are agreeing with me there. Hit, hit the like button if you do agree with that or if you're looking to give this a go. Um, What was I about to say there? Completely lost my train of thought. Oh yeah, as we go forward in to intermediate stages, it's great for them to have another tool in their tool belt that they can draw from. So as my students go forward, often we'll revert to ta and ti, our kadai syllables, when we have things like dotted quaver, semi-quaver, so that's dotted eighth, um, sixteenth, or even sixteenth notes in a row, because one e and a two e, yeah, one e and a two e and a it's quite hard again to say, and unless we need that beat relationship, right, unless we need to emphasize the beats, which is why the numbers are useful, it's not always necessary to have to do that. And ta, tika, tika is a lot easier to say, and therefore easier to do, right? Because if we can say it, we can normally execute it more effectively. So, Carrie, at what point do I transition to counting? So I start to introduce counting um, around if my students are in piano safari, just as an example, when they are going through book the beginning of book two. And I would really consider all of that a transition period. So we would really do about 50-50 on different pieces. For example, if it's a piece that has the melody between the two hands, meaning like the hands aren't actually playing together, there's no accompaniment, it's just a melody that goes, you know, between the two hands in, in sitting beside each other on the piano or something like that, then we will most often go back to Kadai syllables because 
That helps with the overall flow between the two hands, thinking of it as one thing, especially if they don't know the words to the particular folk song or whatever it is. Uh, whereas if they're doing, they're going to have to coordinate the two hands, counting is very useful there because you can understand how the hands fit together. Does that make sense? So I want them to be able to do both forever. And we start to introduce that counting around that stage. And for me, that would be in a student's probably second year, possibly halfway through their second year. It depends if they're on the younger side, you know, because I take a lot of younger beginners. So it would take them quite a while to get to that stage, Carrie. Hope that helps. Uh, yeah, uh, Karen, hopefully I've answered your question a little bit there about the transition to the number system, but let me know if you need a follow up on that and specifically how I do it. If you were asking about that area or anything um, you want clarification on there. Let me share these four games with you guys, though, and you can ask me more questions as we go through. So if you're new to the chats, we welcome questions at any stage. It's all about chatting back and forth. So feel free to ask me anything that comes up for you. So our first rhythm game is the simplest one. It's the one you all know, but just in case you've forgotten to do this in your online lessons, start doing some echoes. It's the simplest thing in the world. <coughs> to use our early example. And then your student claps that back to you. Some little tips on echoes. First of all, vary what you do. So not always clapping. That just gets boring. Tapping the table, playing it on one note on the piano. My piano, my keyboard's not on. Playing it on one note on the piano. Uh, tapping, you know, so they, they're just watching you do it. Silly things like that sometimes. It, it'd have to be a bigger movement, really, for it to work on camera. And different sounds and just get experimental, you know, get them to get two pens that they're tapping out so that you're varying the timbre and the action that they're doing and that you're doing and understanding that it's rhythm is rhythm is rhythm. Okay, so it's particularly important to take that and put it on the piano because otherwise with clapping, right, it's just the initial sound. There's no, the sound doesn't continue. And so with some students, that can be a bit of a sticky thing, and especially on the longer ones. Obviously, I do a clap and a shake, but still, they aren't always getting that, that that's actually the same continuing. So it's important to mix and match piano and clapping. Uh, chopsticks are great for that, Amy. Absolutely. I was saying pens mostly because we want something that's already in the student's house. <laughs> Maybe they have chopsticks, but already probably nearby the piano so that we're not having them go hunt around the house and we don't have to give them anything, do any porch drop-offs or anything like that for this. Um, yeah, so lots of people saying rhythm instruments, um, but like I say, I'm talking about online lessons. So yes, at the studio, yeah, rhythm instruments, but my students don't necessarily all have rhythm instruments, so it's good for, you know, them to vary what they're doing on their end as well, which is why I gave those suggestions. Um, Karen, a lesson that shows the transition to counting? I'm not really sure how to answer that, which doesn't happen often. Um, but what I would say is for me, it involves a lot of writing in the counts initially. Um, there is a video there's a blog post on this. If you look up metric counting, even in Google, you should come across our blog post. So teaching metric counting, something like that. You should come across a blog post where I went into that in more detail. Hopefully it uh, that helps. Yeah, I understand. Lynn is asking the same question, but uh, I think it's beyond the scope of this one right here. So um, look up that blog post. I think that'll be useful for you, Karen. And so you think about that transition, or maybe we can do a future uh, chat about it if enough people are interested. Now, so Echoes is our simplest one. The next one, the next three that I have to share with you, we'll all use these. So these are rhythm vocab cards. Okay. 
Here are the vocab cards, and they are on the site, so if you remember, you can just find them in the library. We also shared these in a blog post a while back. They're a slightly older version, but you could use those. You can also write out your own rhythms. These are just really handy to have. The ones I have here are actually level four, so they come in different levels. The, the beginning ones start to introduce just crotchets and quavers, and then it gradually builds up. These ones are level four because they have um, syncopa. Okay, so that's a syncopated rhythm. Tita T for those who don't use syncopa, and things like that. So that's quavers and semi quavers and different groupings like that. So the rhythm vocab cards go through. They go four four rhythms like I just described that. Don't go beyond uh, quavers and dotted crotchets and things like that. And then we go into 3, 4 and then 6, 8. And then the last level is this sort of syncopated and a lot more mixing up of different note values in back in 4, 4. All of these games that I'm sharing, by the way, are from this book. And again, members can get a PDF copy of this in the library and the full video course, which will walk you through each of these. What I've done is I've picked out four games from here that, well, there's more than that that work particularly well in online lessons, but these were just four that I chose that are work very easily, are easily adapted to an online lesson situation. Um, yeah, so Nic Nicola, uh, she asked about the Rhythm in Five book, and obviously the majority of the games use the Kadai method, how would I go back transitioning, switching to metric to this. So you can count out the rhythms if you want to, but really that book is designed to get students thinking in a rhythmic vocabulary and feeling rhythm, because that's where I think we're missing the trick for most lessons. And most teachers are doing the next part, which is the metric counting and the anal the analysis of rhythms and thinking in that way but what we're not getting is the feeling that's what I feel a lot of students are missing so that's really what that's designed around there is one in particular that is for metric counting I can't remember oh count teddy is that the right one yeah I did write it <laughs> I just forget which one's which sometimes so uh yeah count teddy is about counting but otherwise it's mostly designed to be about working with syllables so that students can feel the rhythmic vocabulary and have that um, built into their brain so that they can call upon it. hope that makes sense. Obviously, you can then take that knowledge and apply metric counting to it and the feeling and apply metric counting to that, but it's it's really about feeling things first. So it's it comes to, back to the idea of uh, experiencing something before you see the notation for it and before you uh, analyze what's going on, right? Feeling first. Okay, so you're struggling in the opposite direction. Yeah, that's certainly um, an interesting one. So she's, Nicola is saying there that she's struggling with the switch herself, I believe from metric counting to Kadai. That's really just about practicing it yourself and forcing yourself to do it with students, even if it's a bit uncomfortable, even if it feels a bit silly at first, you just have to do it. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have a better, a nicer answer there. Let's look at this Go Blank Go game though. So the idea here is that your student would pick out six cards or you would write out six bars of rhythm. Sorry, your student or you, since you're in an online lesson and they're not there. So I just pick out six at random, show them myself, me doing that, and then I'm going to use my overhead cam to lay them out for my student so that they can see them. In the studio I would do this in a row, but I'll do this in a few lines. Instead, I picked out all ones from the end. I should have shuffled them, that's why they're all triplets. But <laughs> you get the idea. So go blank go. You would first tap or clap and say the whole rhythm. Your student would. You can demonstrate first if needed. So clap and say the whole rhythm. And then you need to pick 
one of those, every rid- every card is always a bar, so you pick one bar, so let's say the third one, and that is going to be a rest. So your student now has to clap the whole thing, but they need to rest for a full bar here. So they're going to do a four beat rest and then continue. The important part of go blank go is that you're not taking this away. So I'm not going to help them by doing this. No, that's not that's used in other games. But in this one, they have to remember and focus enough to keep going and put their rest in there. And then once they've gotten that, you pick another one. Okay, so they're gonna do this one and this one and you decide very clearly together and they need to track that and rest for that right length of time for that bar. And then you do that again until they're basically doing rest for the entire thing except one bar. So it gets a bit silly and fun at the end, but it's a great practice for thinking through rhythms and experimenting in that way. Let me know if you're following what I'm saying there. As I said, members can find instructions for this in the library or anyone who has the Rhythm in Five book obviously has it there as well. Okay, just checking in with the chat here. Eloise, great to hear that Kadai language has helped you and your students as well. Uh, Morgan has some great suggestions for home instruments here. I love this. Empty coffee can drum, wooden kitchen spoons, beans in small containers for shakers. Yes, great to have those homemade instruments and get really creative with that and encourage your students to prepare something for their lesson, right? That you can do um, yeah, with your students. And Amy says, love these games that get students to audiate. Yes, absolutely an important step to include in all our games. So the next one is called Unjumble. So again, I've only chosen ones, well the first one, Echoes doesn't require anything except maybe some coffee cans and stuff that Morgan has suggested there. But uh, Unjumble, I'm going to actually pick at random this time, is another one that uses the Rhythm Vocab cards. So all the ones that use Rhythm Vocab, by the way, they can be used with any level of the cards. This one uses four cards, so I've picked out four at random. We'll switch over the camera again. By the way, this is just my empty whiteboard that I'm putting them on, because it's a handy place to show them. You could also draw this if you want to. You could use the whiteboard feature in Zoom or something and draw the rhythms on screen yourself. Okay, so this is Unjubble, and I always do this in this format, so I lay them out in a grid rather than in a line. And what we're going to do here is clap the rhythm, but not in this order. So you would clap, for example, this one, then, and this is you clapping, by the way, the teacher. This one, this one, this one, this one. Okay, so that's the order you choose. You choose that in your head. You clap the whole thing in that order. And they need to put it in the correct order. So when they're in person, they would then, I think I said this way, didn't I? Put that in a line. Now online, they can't move them around and there's no point them telling you which ones to put where. So what I would suggest you do is you get them to write it out. They'll get extra practice with notating the rhythms and they're going to write out the order that they think you clapped those cards in or played them in or whatever way you're performing the rhythm, right? So they need to unjumble the cards, and again, they have to keep quite a lot in their head to do that. I would only suggest these level 4 cards for your students who have been learning for a while. Obviously, keep it simple, and you can do just 3 cards. You can up it to 6 if your students need a challenge, or even 8, as they keep them in their head. I've had a lot of questions before from teachers, actually, and I've certainly had students who struggle with this too, with... um rhythm dictation exercises that or even when they're composing their own piece that the hardest part is them figuring out what rhythm they played so exercises like this are great for that because they can put it together like a jigsaw it's a little bit of an uh, in-between step for them to be able to transcribe rhythms in whatever format they need to do that later on Eloise says, oh, can't wait to try and jumble. I'm so excited you're going to try that one out. Eloise, that's awesome. And Bagyard, great. I think it's your first time on the show, so welcome, if it is. 
And great to have you here from over in Singapore. It's nice and... Well, it's not too late, is it? You're all right. Eloise is in... Yeah, same time zone too. Okay, last one then. So that's Unjumble. Last one I have to share with you is Memory Train. This is one of my go-tos. I do this all the time. So again, we're going to lay out some rhythm cards. I'm going to choose... I should have just kept the same four, but anyway. We live and learn, don't we? So, <laughs> I'm going to lay these out on the board as well, just so I can show you what we're doing. So we lay them out. Normally these would be in a straight line again, but we're going to do them in two lines like that. And then clap the whole thing. Your student claps the whole thing. And then you say, okay. Can you remember what that one said? And they tell you what it was. Normally slowly, slightly rolling their eyes. They can look again if they need to. They just ask you. And then they clap the whole thing with that one, including that one, but they can't see it anymore. But they still clap the entire thing, perform the entire thing. And then they know what's coming the next time. As you flip the next one over, same procedure. Can you remember what this one said? Okay, let's clap the whole rhythm again. And again, until they have memorized the whole thing. So they're doing the whole thing every time so that they get lots of practice with it and they get better and better at performing it and they can remember it more easily when we get to the last one because so, they've practiced it so many times. One of the reasons why I absolutely love to do this one is because they have then memorized a rhythm pattern and it's very easy to take that and then improvise with it, compose with it and just generally use it as a springboard for other creative activities and there's lots of suggestions for stuff like that with every game in Rhythm in Five but this one is particularly useful for that because that's Rhythm in Five um, because they have memorized it Right, so you don't have to then have the cards on the screen when they play with it or write it down or anything like that. You could even have them try and remember how it was notated and rewrite it for themselves before they come up with their own composition or they could do that for homework. Lots and lots of creative things that you can do there. Yeah, sorry if I'm wrong about the time zone, by the way, Eloise. It is a, is it the same time zone? I'm not very good at latitude. Longitude? Okay, I'm, I'm way out of my comfort zone. Geography is not my thing. I'm just going <laughs> to be quiet about that. Um, I don't think all of Asia is in one time zone. I was just thinking that, yeah, anyway. So, um, yes, sort of. So, Brianna... If you set each rhythm up as a separate image as a manipulator via shared PowerPoint or Google Slides, yeah, the thing is that they couldn't move them around in presentation mode. They could only move them around when it's in edit mode. So it might get a bit finicky. I would prefer just to have them write it on a, on a piece of paper, but obviously if you want to experiment with that, it's fun to try out different things. Uh, Tess, that's a great question. How do you think this would work with a class of students online? I'm a private uh, lessons and classroom music teacher in CA. So, I think this would work great in a class situation. Um, pretty much all of them. But I would suggest starting with unjumble. Because I think that would be the easiest transition. So if you do unjumble, you have those there. You perform them in a student certain order or you choose one student to do that that you know can perform it accurately and they choose the order to perform it in and then everyone else needs to write it down so that's the reason why I would think it would transition particularly well to a class because then everyone can quietly write it down and then you just call on one of those students and say okay what what did you write down or show us your piece of paper or whatever and I think that would work great Lynn 700 students! Whoa! <laughs> That's a lot of students. I could not keep those in my brain. That's amazing. Okay. 
great stuff. I hope these games have been useful for you guys and that you got a lot out of this and that it's encouraged you to include more rhythm in your online lessons as well as your in-person lessons and that maybe you'll pick up the book or become a member and you can access it there so that you can get more of these types of games. Um, I think that there are certain things, yes, that are harder to teach in online lessons and we talked about, for example, technique recently and I gave you some tips in that chat about how I'm teaching technique and how I'm still making that work. But there are some things that work just as well, if not even better. And I think oral and rhythm work sort of fits into that category. So we can seize that opportunity that maybe some of our other stuff isn't going as well as usual. Maybe we don't have an overhead camera and so we our rope pieces are just falling by the wayside. Okay, so take that time and spend it on oral work and rhythm and your students are going to be so much better for it and you're taking advantage of the online lesson situation rather than just getting discouraged by it or upset that you can't do your favourite things. You can't improvise together in a duet. It won't work. <laughs> so maybe you replace that time with these kinds of things and make these creative by taking those composition extensions and improvising with things and all of that good stuff. So I hope you'll join me back here again on Friday. This is our second last week at that current schedule. So we're uh, here Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays and we have been for several months. I say we because I'm including everyone who's a regular <laughs> in that. Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. So Friday is our second last Friday and then next week we're going to do the full week again and then after that I think we're going to go down to just Wednesdays just so that you know what's going on. I think it's going to be Wednesdays from there on just once a week. Uh, it should still be super fun and we'll get into lots of things. If you haven't been here on a Friday before you might not know that Friday is when I take suggestions for content for next week. So I hope you'll come along to suggest some stuff that you want to see there. And then the webinar, which Bagyard has just asked about, um, is about marketing. So it's about very human automation that is going to really level up not just how you attract new students, but how well you retain your students over the long haul, which is what we all want because we all want to make great musicians and that takes time. Okay, so that's going to be on Friday evening, my time, so a little bit later just a few hours later and uh, yeah it's going to be a fun one I hope you can come along to that and if you do need access to resources you can use the coupon for about another week and a half so you're going to want to hop to it as soon as you see this video to make sure you get in under the wire that is going to get you a one week trial for one dollar and go to vibrantmusicteaching.com the webinar timing is going to be too late for you, I think, in Singapore, but it is 6 p.m. my time on Friday. But you're still going to want to sign up at that link if you want to watch the replay, because that way you'll get the link to the replay as well. So if it is too late for you, yeah, I think it is. I think it'll be like 1 a.m. or something for you in Singapore. So um, you might want to watch the replay, but you can sign up at that link either way and you will get the links to join me live or on the replay. Thank you all so much for joining me. Feel free to share these videos with uh, colleagues that you think might enjoy them. Make sure to subscribe to the channel while you're here so that you get the next one and encourage them to do so as well. And hit the like button before you leave so that this video spreads far and wide and we get wonderful transfer students with amazing rhythm skills. No matter where our students come from in the world, right? Wouldn't that be cool? Okay, let's, let's give it a go. Let's share the video so that all students get better rhythm skills and we get to enjoy improved musicians all over the world. Fantastic. Thank you so, all so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure as always and I'll catch you again on Friday. Bye for now.